What's up guys, Jace Two Cents here and I took a break from building my new studio to take a look at something I'm excited to unbox and play with. Something I've been waiting for for a long time that just very well might be the most overkill graphics card on the planet. Today's video is sponsored by Drop.com and the Mass Drop Plus Universal IEMs, the first earbuds tuned by Drop. With its three armature drivers and two-way configuration, two vented drivers and multi-bore sound channels per ear, the Mass Drop Plus Universal IEMs deliver extended bass and clarity. To see all the specs and to learn more, click the link in the description below. So one of the things that this company is known for in their shipping is their packing peanuts. And if you've been following me long enough, you know why that is. Oh, they use air pack now. <laughs> EVGA no longer uses the edible cornstarch packing peanuts. Check this out. Look at the size of this box. Holy crap. So this is the 2080 Ti Kingpin full retail card. I thought they were gonna be sending me like some sort of engineering deal in like a brown box. Check that out. To give you an idea, <laughs> I thought their other packaging was crazy. Yeah, your girth versus the girth of the guy she tells you not to worry about. So I'm really excited about this because if you guys aren't aware, I actually have a bit of a Kingpin card collection going. Um, this was my previous Kingpin. This is the 980 Ti. But the reason why I'm bringing these out is I kind of want to see how the aesthetics over time has sort of changed. Oh my God, geez, such a fanboy. You're right, man. I've, I've spent so much money at EVGA over the years that I deserve this. Oh my God, so much, I'm, it's a water-cooled card. Okay, well that's, that would make sense if they were, right? Because one of the problems, to be honest, with the Kingpin card, it's not all cupcakes and sprinkles, is in an air-cooled fashion like these, you don't get anywhere close to the capability of the card. And that's because the card is truly binned. EVGA takes the best chips and puts them on the EVGA card, or the, of course they're on the EVGA card, the Kingpin card. And then you've got to do things like EV bot and manual overclocking and overvolting and all that sort of stuff to get its true potential. In fact, I think Steve, you know, Gamers Next to Steve recently did a live stream where he hit something like 2600 megahertz on LN2. And that's what the card is truly designed for. It is designed for LN2 overclocking. But at least with the water cooler, just like the one we took a look at at CES, so it's very similar. Um, that wasn't a final version, so I'm not sure exactly what's different because I don't have them side by side. But at least on water, we're gonna get more out of it. But just like we saw at CES, it's got the OLED display on the side right here, which is gonna show us real live temperature readout, um, wattage, all that sort of stuff. And then we've got uh, connector panels back here. So if you're doing manual overclocking LN2 and stuff, you can hook your probes right up uh, to the harness that comes off here and you get a live hardware reading of voltage and stuff. You don't have to count on software, which is not the most accurate. On the back, the usual suspects. We've got a fan header, three eight pin power connectors. We've also got EV bot connector right there. And I think that's a USB-C, it looks like micro USB. I'm not entirely sure what that's for. I should probably RTFM. I'm kind of glad to see that they got away from the air cooler. Although that would be a more universal drop-in solution. These air cooled cards, man, they're just not being shown justice. Although the cooler is good. It, may, it would make them fall kind of just in the same category as any other custom air-cooled card until you really start pushing it so that you can see the, uh, the bend chips in effect. What I wanted to show here before I hook it up is at least Kingpin gave us back a full-size display port where the other cards always had mini display port like you see right here and then they would give you an adapter to adapt it from mini display port to a standard size display port. And I asked them once why they did that and they said it's because if you take the cooler off and you do the, the pot and all that, you could go single bracket or single card slot. The card also does have active cooling on the VRMs because the problem is if you start going LN2 and stuff and you take this off, you lose uh, active cooling over the VRMs. Where at least here, they have a, a heat sink separate on the back and a fan to keep things nice and cool. So with all that out of the way, I took it up in the test bench and see how much we can get out of this thing without going any sort of exotic cooling. It is a triple BIOS card. So you've got a normal BIOS, which is a green light. You've got an OC BIOS, which is an orange light, and an LN2 BIOS, which is a red light. Now you're still gonna have some locked functionality even with these BIOS set. How far we can get this thing to go on just water. I am on the LN2 BIOS though, because I wanted to see how far we could push this on water and hopefully not damage it. I wanna do a baseline run here first, and we'll use 3 d Mark for this. I wanna see what our stock score is and then what our max overclock score is. 
So if you download the latest beta precision, uh, you can then get control over that display, which we're having some fun with. As you can see, Jay's Two Cents is the best ever, which is what it's saying on there, and it never deviates because it's the absolute truth and all of the truths that have ever truthed the truthing world. But you have a couple different things you can do here. We can even put in a picture and apply. <laughs> <laughs> so now that that creepiness is out of the way, let's go, let's go ahead and, uh, where's my CPU running at? Let's go ahead and perform our five gigs. All right, let's go and perform our time spy. We'll just do regular time spy scores and see what we get. So our graphic score is a 15,776, which is a single GPU in time spy non-extreme. The core clock started out at a 2070 all on its own. Remember, this is factory temperature curve, factory, well, the fan curve isn't, but the factory power limit, all that stuff. We didn't touch anything, as you can see right here. It's all still set to default. And uh, so it started out at a 2070, dropped to a 2055, and then looks like 2055 is where it sort of stayed. Memory is not overclocked. It's still sitting at 7,000. So it looks like we still hit the approximately 43C. That is our baseline. So we need to see how much higher we get than a 15776 when we overclock. I have a feeling we're not gonna gain much. The chips until they get cooled, and by cooled I mean chilled water, some sort of a chiller, peltier, LN2, dry ice, whatever. Until you really bring the temperatures of the core down, they all kind of land around the same mark. So I'm really hoping here for uh, 2200 on this AIO setup. I'm not sure if we'll get it, but that's what I'm hoping for. So I'm starting here by just maxing out our power limit, which is 144%, 44% above 100. Now the 100 from like the RTX uh, Founders Edition model, the baseline moves up. So it's 44% of the new baseline, or the new, what's considered the 100% the power limit. We're also gonna go ahead and prioritize GPU temp. And I'm not going to touch the clock at all. I'm curious as to if we get a higher clock. So I'm gonna test that real quick with um, Heaven, just to see what our new core clocks are. All right, so by raising the power limit to 144, we gained no score whatsoever. In fact, we went from a 1577 to a 15749. That's all within margin of error. Let's try going 100 to put us around 2150. Radiator still nice and cool. And during the test, the radiator wasn't feeling like it was getting any sort of thermal soak at all. It felt like the same amount of room temperature air coming through it. So that tells me the 240 is more than sufficient too for keeping that die cool. All right, so we went up to 16481 and it looks like it shot up to 2160, which was um, technically 90 megahertz, because remember it was going to 2070 first. And then it dropped down to 2145 constant. But the constant is what's making me happy right there. And I haven't even touched the memory yet to see how far we can go with this. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna max this out, I'm gonna find where we crash, and then I'll tell you guys where that was. All right, so this is where we kind of landed. Uh, a gain of about 1150 or so. We went from a 15776 to a 16936. That's a pretty hefty gain by just moving some sliders. Um, obviously nowhere near where a card like this is capable of capping out because we don't have the equipment to truly get us as far as we possibly can with this card. Uh, our max speed here started at 2190. Because it goes in 15 megahertz increments, the next step up was 2205, which was not stable. It would run for a little while and then crash. And then if we start at 2190, it runs for a little bit, drops down one 15 megahertz um, tick down to 2175, and that's perfectly stable all the way across. We are running a one gigahertz overclock on our memory. And we haven't touched anything with voltage, just power slider and uh, our, our core slider, as well as our memory, and this is what we got. So pretty hefty jump. But what we're gonna do right now is there is another aspect to this. Th this is not your everyday card. This is not a card designed for the average gamer that just wants to plop it in their computer and go because it would not be cost effective. There are plenty of cards that can reach this level with just the air cooling or water cooling like this that do not come with the price premium of the Kingpin card because this card is designed for the XOC community, the extreme overclockers that want a card that don't require having to solder uh, power delivery, custom power delivery to the motherboard, that don't want to have to come up with custom solutions for bypassing all of the safeguards that are in place on retail boards. That's why Kingpin designed these cards is so that you can plug in EVBot, take full control over it, you can remove all of the safeguards through custom BIOS. There's lots of things you can do with this card that just are not going to be uh, end user friendly for the average consumer, myself included. I have. 
I've only played with this level of overclocking once under Kingpin's supervision, which is why I'm excited that in July, we're gonna be doing another thing with him at EVGA's headquarters regarding liquid nitrogen cooling and all of that on this card. So I'm extremely excited for that. So that's why I kind of want to see where we can get on my own just with this and maybe hooking this radiator up to the air conditioner to bring the temps down to see what happens. Because what we do know, and they give me, they, there's a whole guide on the uh, XOC community talking about, I think it's XDEV, talking about this card and the temperature scale and what happens to the core clock stability as the temperature drops. So they give us this really nice chart that kind of shows how temperature correlation with stability goes hand in hand. So until you can get the temperatures under control, you're not gonna get the core clock stable at the higher frequencies. As you go with the higher frequency, you also need more voltage, which is why having an unlocked card like this with a custom power delivery system de designed exclusively by Kingpin's team means that this card is designed for that. So that's why you're gonna, you might watch this and go, well, that don't make sense. That's, that's the same speed as he was getting with the Founders Edition card. But well, that's because under the same conditions is what we're dealing with here. Whereas the Founders Edition card actually hits a much lower power limit. So let's just go ahead and say the Trio card or the Strix or whatever, it's roughly the same as that. <clears throat> But here's what we're gonna do now. Let's let's chill it a little bit here and see what happens. Oh shit, this thing's heavy. This guy hasn't come out in a while. He's gonna come out to play. Haha. -ha. So it looks like around 14C is where we are uh, dropping. Condensation's under control because we're not far enough below the dew point to get any measurable condensation. Like if anything, it feels slightly moist but there's nothing in the lines and stuff. It's not, it's not cold enough. Anytime we do this, people freak out. Oh my God, Jay, the condensation. No, that'd be like saying turning on the AC in your room is gonna make the inside of your walls condense. And that's not the way it's, no. Question is now, can we get 2205? We, we couldn't do this at all before. So there's your direct comparison too of what visually that curve looks like of core clock versus temperature, because this is 20 C colder than it was with just the ambient air and the fans uh, blowing through the rad. But now that we're blowing chilled air, you can see we're maxing out at 24C, 2205, no problems without touching voltage yet. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna see where we crash without touching voltage and we'll see if voltage helps at all. So that's what we got. With just hooking the air conditioner up to it, not touching voltage and just giving us more stability through temperature, because like I said earlier, this shows how temperature directly relates to stability before voltage is even involved. So we are gonna go ahead now bring up the voltage tool and we are going to, uh, we're gonna see what happens. All right, so we decided this is probably a pretty good place to stop here. One, we reached 32 degrees uh, C on our core temp, which is not too hot, but as we've already talked about, as this temp goes up, the core stability goes down. We did get it to pass 2200. We had a weird kind of a spot right there, which we didn't have in the other test, so I'm not sure what happened there. Our score did come up to a 17,890, so we got more than 2,000 gra graphics points higher with this overclock, uh, a little bit over voltage. But also too, the card was screaming at me. It said plus five volt, too high, and then all the lights were flashing and everything, and I'm like, come on, baby, come on. It didn't die and it didn't melt, but it definitely was warning me that the five volt was too high, which is interesting because we didn't touch five volt on here. So I think it's some sort of an algorithm when we move the core slider and stuff. That could be completely normal when you go that far on the overclocks with using the classified software. I don't know. So I don't want to kill the card yet, but I just wanted to kind of overclock. I said, yet. yet. <laughs> it could happen. I, uh, I, I, I at least wanted to play around with some of these features because it's something I never did on any of the previous generations. I'm a lot more comfortable now with kind of playing around with these extreme voltages and stuff, which we didn't do extreme today, but we will. But I've been, uh, I've had fun this last year playing around with LN2 and all that sort of stuff. So we're going to probably end up putting a LN2 pod on this and seeing how far we can get this to go. So anyway, that is that. Um, nothing else to really talk about, except this card shouldn't make any sense to you unless you're an extreme overclocker or you want to play around with those types of features and, and money is not really an object and taking the risk of destroying the card and you want to have those features readily available to you without having to do any sort of custom board modding and stuff. So anyway, if you guys want to learn more about this card, you can head over to evga.com. It's extremely limited. I have no idea how many are being made. It's probably hard to get your hands on one now as it is and they are really expensive because of the custom one-off nature of this card. So guys, tell me what you think down below in the comments on uh, how you feel this card performed. Obviously with the AIL hooked up to the AC, it got us above where we could go. Not by a whole lot though. You could see we only went from 
2175 perfectly stable to 2205 and then 2220, which is not a lot. I mean, we're talking, what, 30 megahertz or 50 megahertz at the most by giving it way more voltage and dropping the temps with this. But we know this card likes to be around the minus 150C on LN2, so that's where we're gonna see the really big overclocks. All right, guys, thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one. What's wrong with me? Let's do this again. I haven't touched the computer for four days, dude. This is what happens. How does computer? How does overclock? Well, I would be like my dad. How do you...